My name is Clay Purvis. I'm the Director for Telecommunications and Connectivity with the Department of Public Service. We're here tonight to discuss the Vermont 10-year telecommunications plan. Uh, we are now at the final draft of that plan, and this is the second draft uh, that um, <clears throat> we've issued. I have with me tonight uh, Matt Dunn from Rural Innovation Strategies Incorporated and CTC Technology and Energy. Uh, they are the groups that the Department of Public Service hired to uh, complete the 10-year telecommunications plan. Uh, tonight, uh, we're here to get comment from uh, uh, members of the public, such as yourselves, on, um, on this draft of the plan and any changes that uh, you might recommend we make. Uh, we are scheduled to uh, issue uh, the final adopted plan on June 30th. Uh, this is the uh, third of <clears throat> four meetings. Excuse me, it's the third of five meetings we're having. Uh, the first meeting was last week, last Thursday in Montpelier. We had a, a meeting with uh, the legislature uh, yesterday afternoon. And uh, today we're here in Springfield. Um, tomorrow we'll be in Craftsbury at the Craftsbury Town Hall. Uh, that meeting will also be online. And then we'll finally we'll have a meeting uh, on Monday, June 28th at the Dorset um, town offices, um, which uh, should hopefully be online. Uh, please stay tuned for that. We have a physical space uh, designated. Um, we're still uh, strategizing how we can have an online meeting as well, but we will post that uh, call and information once we have that established. Um, so for the uh, hearing tonight, we're going to start with a, a very brief uh, overview of the plan from Matt Dunn, and then we are going to move to your comments, and we'll start with folks um, uh, who are joining us online, and then we'll take comments from folks uh, on the phone, and then we'll move to anyone who might be uh, joining us in person uh, down in Springfield. So with that, Matt, uh, I'll turn it over to you. Great. Thank you, Clay, uh, and uh, delighted to be here uh, in Windsor County uh, in Springfield at the Black River Innovation Campus, uh, which is a, for those who haven't made it here yet, it's a beautiful space with 10 gigabit connectivity, uh, which is uh, relevant to this conversation of the potential uh, that can happen uh, when uh, fiber to the home is built out. Uh, this is a co-working space and innovation hub. And uh, anyway, it's just it's super exciting to 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 be here uh, and to be here in an unmasked uh, <laughs> situation now that uh, the state is opening up. Um, we are uh, uh, d delighted to uh, share this uh, very uh, summarized overview of the 10-year telecommunications plan. Um, we are anticipating that people have had a chance to uh, take a look at it uh, in its entirety. Um, this is not meant to cover all of the elements of the 300-plus page document, um, but want to just highlight some, uh, some pieces for folks and provide some additional context. So this is the uh, overview of what we're going to be uh, reviewing today. Uh, and it, you know, we'll talk about the opportunity, the core values that informed uh, this plan that came from the statute. We'll talk about uh, terrestrial broadband uh, uh, parts of the uh, plan, uh, mobile broadband, uh, public safety, and then uh, PEG television. So what we want to you know, say at the outset is that uh, the creation of this 10-year plan came at a unique moment uh, in history in Vermont, uh, where the urgency that came out of COVID put us in a position of uh, actually having the motivation uh, and the resources to finally ensure that all uh, individuals in Vermont had access to broadband. And our, our focus is on the 51,000 premises that currently uh, do not have even uh, cable uh, speeds of broadband service. 
uh, and this is a uh, a, a gr group of places that it's clear uh, the the market just isn't going to serve on its own. Uh, we see these uh, as as the places where the emphasis of the investment uh, should take place, and that the investment that happens should ensure future-proof broadband, 100 over 100 fiber to the home. Uh, because what that does is not only leapfrog these locations uh, from having very poor broadband service to excellent service, but it also is the kind of investment that is going to be able to scale over time. Because once you put in fiber to the home, you can actually do equipment upgrades and allow it to go from 100 over 100 to 500 over 500 gigabit over a gigabit or even 10 gigabit symmetrical service. Um, and the cost of that, we've spent uh, a significant amount of time in this plan uh, to refine those numbers. Uh, that, that estimate is between $360 million and $440 million. Uh, the difference, by the way, uh, between those two numbers uh, is whether or not uh, we connect uh, re uh, uh, premises that are designated as camps uh, this is kind of a unique Vermont uh, <laughs> uh, situation, uh, and there is a you know a range of views as to whether uh, uh, premises that are considered camps uh, should be connected. As you can imagine, they tend to be in more remote locations uh, where the cost of actually getting broadband service to them is more expensive. But that gives you a pretty accurate sense of what that cost would be. And with the ARPA money that is has been currently allocated by the legislature and then is available to be allocated, plus the resources that are likely to come through an infrastructure package, this is doable. Uh, this is something that can happen uh, over the next several years and became the focus of this plan was how to achieve this infrastructure uh, goal that we have had for uh, 20 years. Uh, and allow that to support the state moving forward. You know, the core values that went into this 10-year uh, uh, telecom plan came from the legislation itself, and, uh, and we looked at it through the framework of what is going to be the most efficient strategy for bringing high-speed internet, what is going to allow for, you know, the, the long-term support of telecommunication needs. We also understand uh, that the uh, state, uh, through its legislation, uh, has made local control or working through uh, CUDs as a priority. Uh, and then finally, to make sure that there is equity, that, that individuals throughout Vermont will have access uh, to high-speed internet, uh, regardless of geography. Uh, but also income race or any other factor. So in the pursuit of high speed internet and 100 over uh, the 100 over 100 goal that was set by the legislature uh, has been complicated by uh, some factors that we think are important to acknowledge. Uh, one is that the reverse auction that the FCC undertook uh, this last year uh, provided subsidy uh, to a variety of different broadband providers, uh, but not in a coordinated fashion. Uh, it allowed for uh, some of the broadband uh, providers to, uh, to secure funding to build uh, fiber to the home, uh, to the densely populated areas of a broader region, but not those other locations. So it, it made the communication union district planning process uh, that much more difficult um, because if you're going to try to build a uh, network uh, and suddenly the the core of that network is going to be uh, subsidized for someone else to be able to provide to, it makes that planning difficult. Uh, the second is that the stimulus money uh, did not just come to Vermont, it's coming to the entire country, which is causing intense labor and materials uh, demand. Uh, which is going to make uh, the construction timeline and, and probably the cost as well not exact, as predictable as it may have been in the past. Uh, and the final thing is that uh, CUDs are not all created uh, equally in their current state. Uh, they, some of them are very sophisticated and have uh, been running uh, an ISP for, for some time. 
Uh, others have just recently formed and are all volunteer. So uh, with the decision to utilize CUDs as a major conduit for the resources to be able to build out broadband, there is going to need to be greater support for those CUDs to make sure they're going into that process uh, with the right tools and expertise to be successful. Uh, the H360 framework, uh, the, the legislation that uh, passed this year, uh, certainly uh, was you know, front of mind as we were doing the plan, and, and in fact is very much aligned with where we had arrived independently as the best strategy for the uh, uh, for the state moving forward. Uh, there are uh, a number of specifics that we got into that went beyond what was uh, immediately recommended in the, the, uh, the legislation, uh, but completely aligned. Uh, so there are some things that we do believe absolutely need to be requirements, as well as items that we think uh, are, are best positioned as priorities, as they were in the statute, uh, and we articulate that uh, in the plan itself. There are some questions uh, that enacting 360 uh, are, are going to have to be uh, uh, confronted. Uh, these are not necessarily easy questions like how do you make sure that there is uh, precision in the award of funding process uh, as well as meeting the uh, desire to have CUDs universal service plans be uh, the focus and, uh, and and how to adjudicate uh, whether or not there is a conflict uh, with the uh, with another uh, provider's um, investment, uh, all the way through to how to think about um, circumstances where a CUD's uh, effort uh, doesn't actually work out. Uh, and we know that these are complicated. Uh, business operations uh, with a number of unknowns. And so understanding that uh, that scenario is going to be important to make sure that we don't end up um, uh, in situations where areas that should be served are, are unserved uh, because of business model uh, not working. There are some technical standards that we believe are critical uh, to make sure that there is interoperability uh, as well as a design uh, that will uh, avoid uh, host remote isolation and other kinds of challenges uh, that would be uh, a problem uh, in the future. Uh, we outline those uh, specifically along with uh, the, uh, the, the type of design that's going to be necessary uh, to ensure uh, at least symmetrical gigabit and, uh, and, and beyond speeds in these uh, locations. There is, uh, as I mentioned before, some needs for the CUDs to have both ex expertise and support um, because we're asking a lot of these largely volunteer uh, organizations and you, you want to make sure that they're going in uh, to be able to do public-private partnerships that are uh, understanding the, the long term and if they're going to be negotiating with uh, you know, large in incumbent telecoms, uh, there's going to have to be a, a certain amount of sophistication and ongoing support in those processes. Uh, and the same if they're going to be doing a lot of the, the building and planning uh, themselves, uh, because these are uh, complex uh, projects uh, with a lot of uh, design that's necessary to be able to do them right. The, in the longer term, uh, once we get past this infrastructure push, we believe that CUDs have a role to play in making sure that uh, everyone is then able to actually avail themselves uh, of the broadband that has been deployed. Uh, it's, it's one thing to make sure that there is infrastructure. It's another to make sure that uh, it's affordable and accessible. So we have uh, a, a number of recommendations of the role that CUDs uh, can play in collaboration with other institutions that have this as part of their core missions, including library schools uh, and PEG television stations. Uh, and so we, we, and we bucket it under affordability, uh, access to devices themselves, uh, without devices, broadband doesn't actually give you much value, and then the digital skills to be able to make the best use of those tools. Uh, and either for making uh, life more affordable, to be able to 
uh, avail oneself of, of careers that can be facilitated online uh, all the way through telehealth. There, beyond the uh, terrestrial broadband uh, that infrastructure that's necessary, there's also mobile broadband. And when we did our survey, uh, this came up over and over again as a high priority for Vermonters. Uh, and so the plan does include uh, recommendations on expanding mobile broadband throughout the state. Uh, but what it also started with is an analysis of where there is broadband today, uh, breaking it out by indoor and outdoor uh, 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 mobile service. Uh, as you can see from this map, you know, there are large, large amounts of the state that are not in our very densely populated areas that, that do not have service. Uh, we do think that indoor, as I, I'll mention later, uh, will be supported by uh, bringing fiber to the home because people can use uh, uh, voice over IP wireless uh, capacity, um, but there is uh, uh, there is lots of outdoor areas uh, that still need uh, uh, coverage, and there is just uh, there is a 23% um, of the addresses uh, are covered uh, are, are, are only 23% are covered uh, at an outdoor capacity in a way that would be predictable. This is a look at the road miles that are covered, uh, and this is particularly important in terms of public safety. Uh, and when you look at our, our class one roads, um, which is largely interstate, there's actually quite good coverage. It's not perfect, uh, but it's at about 91%. Uh, as you get to class two and class three roads, however, it uh, goes down quite dramatically. And so uh, this is definitely an area of concern for public safety and to be able to uh, 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 make a call for, for help, uh, as well as a general sense of where the coverage is in, in the state. Uh, in the uh, plan, we, we have put out some recommendations that if funding is available, uh, either through stimulus or other infrastructure dollars, that there are ways to do an RFP uh, process that would both leverage the creativity of the public sector, uh, or sorry, of the private sector to be able to come uh, to the table with uh, plans for that build out of the infrastructure, um, but also points that would be awarded uh, to make sure that there are uh, in incentives in that process to uh, support multiple uh, providers and to make sure that the likelihood of success is high. As we all know, uh, Vermonters feel strongly about towers. Uh, and so uh, we would want to make sure that the actual solutions that would uh, receive this funding um, could be actionable uh, in the current environment. Uh, public safety is obviously an important part of the telecom system. Uh, and we have uh, we, we received actually a lot of feedback from the first draft uh, and was able to uh, reach out to local uh, uh, safety organizations to get their take on, on where things stand. Um, and I mean, the good news is that the state is has taken steps uh, to uh, to to migrate to to next generation 911 systems. Um, uh, but there is still a need for uh, land mobile radio uh, in our in in the state, uh, because other options like using uh, FirstNet uh, or other kinds of uh, wireless uh, is just not robust. And in the meantime, the MLR uh, LMR systems are aging, uh, and they need upgrades. Uh, there is funding available. We articulate where that those funding sources at a federal level could come from uh, in, in the plan as well. Uh, there is uh, a, a, a discussion as well about the issues of, uh, of voice over IP systems and the reliance on grid power uh, for 911 access. Uh, this comes down to uh, the availability of battery backup 
uh, and allowing or frankly encouraging uh, the, uh, the the telephone and telephony uh, um, uh, providers to be able to uh, provide consumers with a variety of alternatives for power supplies, uh, including additional batteries. Uh, you know, things is, that may seem simple, um, but are absolutely critical. Uh, and we did receive some feedback on that and have incorporated those kinds of recommendations uh, into the plan. Finally, uh, we did address, as was asked in the uh, plan, uh, the, uh, the, the importance of PEG television stations, but also uh, some of the precariousness of the funding. Um, there was a study that was uh, completed uh, by the uh, Berkshire uh, Consulting Report, uh, and we, we heard it loud and clear that PEG channels are really important to Vermonters. Uh, that was uh, particularly true during the pandemic uh, where the their public mission uh, was on display in a wide variety of ways, including making sure that uh, public meetings were continuing to be shared through other kinds of, of platforms rather than in-person meetings. Uh, as well as helping uh, individuals and businesses uh, to be able to use technology uh, to uh, continue to connect uh, during our, our period of time where uh, we were not going to be having in-person communication. Um, the, and the, the funding uh, sources for PEG television are, at, uh, are declining uh, as more and more individuals are using uh, over-the-top uh, types of services rather than uh, going through a traditional uh, cable uh, uh, mechanism. And uh, there are some, uh, some interesting recommendations uh, that were in the Berkshire report. Uh, each of them have some you know, complexities to them. Uh, we did not get into the full legal analysis of each of those because uh, we felt that that was not uh, entirely in scope of the work uh, that we were doing. Um, but we uh, do believe that there is going to be uh, some uh, decisions made in other states that should uh, give an indication to Vermont as to what uh, paths forward uh, would be considered uh, legally viable. Um, but we, we absolutely believe the, the legislature should uh, look to general fund support uh, in the interim uh, until a long-term funding source is uh, found in order to make sure that there is continuity uh, of service from these important uh, institutions in our state. So that's a, uh, an overview of the uh, plan and uh, happy to turn it back over to you, Clay. Great, thank you very much, Matt, I uh, appreciate it. Um, I think we will now start with public comment. Um, all right, just making my screen big. Apologize there. Uh, Matt, could you take us off the um, I can. The presentation? There you are. Great. There you oh. go. Fantastic. All right. All right, so um, now we'll move to the uh, public comment portion of tonight's presentation or tonight's hearing. Um, we'll start with folks who have joined us online um, uh, using the uh, Microsoft Teams meeting uh, uh, application or the web browser, and then we'll move to folks on the phone followed by anyone who's joined in person if there are any. Um, so if you'd like to give a comment, I'd appreciate it if you use the raise hand feature um, that is located in the top right hand corner of the screen. Um, and we'll just go down the line. Um, so the first person who's raised his hand, her hand is Rob Perry, 823. I would appreciate if you uh, <clears throat> put yourself on video if you can. Um, if not, that's okay, uh, but do please state your name and um, yeah, state your name and if you want, you can state the town you're from. Okay, uh, yes, can you hear me? We can hear you. Okay, um, 
I would put it on video, but some upgrade that uh, came to my Windows machine disabled my camera, and I've been <laughs> trying for the last okay. few days to get it back on again. So uh, my name is Robert Perry. I'm the executive director of the Mad River Valley TV station, the PEG, the PEG channel that um, supports Waitsfield, Warren, Faston. Um, we reached Duxbury, um, Moortown, and, and that general area in the Mad River Valley. And I appreciate the comments at the uh, at the end about the importance of PEG. I think, you know, through the 20 years we've been um, a PEG channel in the Valley, um, we've grown in importance and the pandemic really showed how important PEG channels are. Um, <clears throat> the um, legislature agrees and the, the, re the Berkshire report that was commissioned um, is an important step in trying to find out you know, how we can continue to fund our services. Um, because as noted, our major source of funding is cable subscriptions, a piece of that revenue, and that is declining with cord cutting and the over the top players that, that we all use. So we are moving towards a streaming model. We're going to stream the channel. We need to find a way to, to see if we can raise money through that, but it will be launched as a, as a free service for our community. So we do need um, to find a funding source. Um, our concern is that the the study mentions and goes through these conclusions, but doesn't really deal with the issues raised here that you need to do due diligence on the recommendations, really dig into the legality of it. The legislature required that the additional um, due diligence be done and understanding of these, um, these recommendations so we can move forward um, together with broadband, um, expanding broadband access, not in a way that's counter to it or conflicting with it, because we really want to partner with broadband expansion. It's critical to our future that we can connect to our constituents through broadband because our cable audience is declining constantly. So, um, you know, we need to reach our, our, our community through broadband access. And um, so we're looking for a way to partner, uh, not in conflict with broadband expansion. We view that as very important. I view it as important as, as I have DSL at home and I would like to get more than, you know, the 11.7 megabit upload that I might get. Um, and, um, so um, yeah, so that's that's kind of my point that we'd like to move forward in, in partnership with broadband. We don't feel it in conflict. We feel the report somehow sets us up as a as an as a kind of an ancillary um, topic to be sort of a checklist thing, and we think we're a very important part of of the overall telecommunications telecommunications plan going forward. Right. Well, thank you very much. Great. Thank you for your comment. Uh, we'll move next to Will Dodge. Good evening, Will. Hello everyone, uh, nice to be here. Great work that you guys have done on this telecommunications plan. Um, so my name is Will Dodge. I'm an attorney at Downs Rockland Martin. I chair the regulated entities group um, at the law firm and that includes what we call the environment, energy and telecommunications group. And I do a lot of um, work in the siting field. I'm not here tonight to represent any particular client of ours and will um, you know, deny trying to speak for any of them particularly, but I'm more speaking just as a, um, a practitioner uh, who understands um, some of what the department's role is and some of the challenges for um, telecommunications in the state, and also just as a citizen consumer who uh, wants to make sure that all of my equipment works uh, well, especially during a uh, uh, once in a century pandemic. So, one, I'm going to focus my comments specifically on uh, wireless. And one thing that I will note generally about the, uh, the telecommunications plan, figure six, the wireless coverage map, I very much respect the need to show or to try to depict where there is and is not coverage in the state. But I also think that there's been a lot of work done just probably in the short period between the time that this map was created and now, and that it's probably worth doing some updates on it so that the um, that there that there's more focus on some of those underserved areas. So for instance, um, up in the Northeast Kingdom, uh, driving along the border, basically between Canaan to Norton, Norton down, I can attest both as a consumer and as somebody involved in siting that there's great coverage um, along those main roads now that there wasn't even a year ago. Um, and I know that there's you know, some other places. So all by way of saying, 
worth it to probably try as best you can to update that before um, going to final print on the telecom plan or else providing some kind of a disclaimer somewhere that says, you know, this map is constantly changing, something to that effect. The second comment I have more concerns Section 248A, which is the wireless sighting statute. Um, that statute was put into place back in, well, has a long history, but in its current iteration, um, it basically started in about 2009 and has been continually extended um, round about every three years since that time. And what I would say is, as imperfect as wireless coverage is in the state, as, re as represented by that figure number six, it would be substantially worse had you not, had we not had that statute in place. And I also think that we're at the point with it because basically uh, 11 years have gone by that there are more communities uh, that would rather that 248A continue to exist than not exist both because it helps in many instances, in most instances, to expedite those projects that are non-controversial and make it much easier to upgrade facilities, to basically put antennas and, and get more competition on existing towers that have been built than if we didn't have it and everything was run through local zoning and Act 250. And what I'll just say as a practitioner is I've had instances in the past I would say four to five years, where we'll tell a, a municipality, we need to seek permits from you for putting antennas on an existing tower where we're not there today on behalf of a carrier client. And we'll have the zoning administrators or the town planners tell us, please don't bother us with this. Can you please go through 248A? It's much easier. We like it better that way. The other thing that I think that 248A has shown to be more successful in doing is allowing, doesn't always work this way, but when it does work, it works really well for new projects that tend to be more controversial and have more process. It allows for better flexibility in terms of the carrier or the tower developer and the community. And a couple of examples that I can show specifically include Grand Isle, Thetford, and Menden, where there were very controversial projects that ultimately through the course of the process resulted in an approval of a site that was much more, that to which the community, the host community was much more amenable than when we started out. By contrast, the one time in the past decade, or I would say the past five years, where I've been involved where you've got a new tower that's run through Act 250, uh, and that ultimately gets appealed by a party that's, that is against it. And that has to be run to superior court to ultimately run a full de novo trial. It ends up being much more expensive and taking much, much longer, really more expensive for everyone than the alternative, than if it had been run through the um, Public Utility Commission. The last iteration of the draft telecommunications plan at least talked a little bit about should 248A be renewed. And I would just encourage the department to at least think about some type of advocacy or positive statements, or at least, at least an acknowledgement that looking through the course of history, it's proven to be better than the alternative. The last thing that I will say is, at the federal level, there's been a lot of uh, guidance and two specific regulations that have been put out to try to expedite further those non-controversial projects. The PUC has not really taken any type of steps to harmonize how it administers 248A with those, the, with those new federal rules. And where I think that that's headed is you know, an easy way to address it would be to hold workshops or to make even make further changes to the statutes to recognize those federal regulations. The alternative is that if, if that doesn't happen eventually, someone, and this is not meant to be a threat, I'm just saying as a matter of fact, someone's going to end up bringing a lawsuit somewhere and that's going to end up costing someone funds and it'll probably be the state of Vermont, i.e. the taxpayers or the ratepayers, depending on which way you uh, look at it. So it would be great, regardless of what happens, 
to try to make sure that Vermont's laws and rules are harmonized with those new federal requirements that came out of the FCC. And I'd be happy, Clay, to provide a citation to those two regulations, um, you know, separately uh, to you to to at least take a look at. Yes, thank you. Please do that. And um, uh, certainly this is uh, an area where the plan could uh, maybe reference a little more of the history of 248A. So thank you for your comment. I appreciate it. Um, we'll move next to um, Mike uh, Abadi. I don't, I'm sorry if I mispronounced your name. Um, you got it. I got it. Okay, That's great. That's cultural confidence right there. Hello, I'm Thank Michael Abadi. Well said there. Uh, Chair of Work and Media. Just want to thank uh, Vermont State Government for, for historically protecting and supporting public access TV. Um, I produced a show on the Georgia Senate runoff and engaged the public access world down there. And I learned it had been decimated by state law changes. 2007 or something. Atlanta's public access center charges for everything. The Cal County station is just a drop off. No studio, minimal staff. This is how you make media tips. And Vermont is lucky to have a strong public access TV set up, healthy community radio infrastructure, and community minded commercial outlets like WDEP. But state law can starve such outlets, and then citizens are subjected to manipulation and misinformation. So I hope you think about not just the technical questions, but also ensuring that we have local, public, cultural infrastructure. And I propose you take the okay, funding study and set up a trigger point. Cable revenues go, goes down by a certain percent, 10 or 25 percent. You pick it, a fee would kick in. And the cable revenue continued to fall, that fee would increase. Design a mechanism to get your foot in the door and send it off to legislators. People have determined tech stations are essential and also may be determining at the same time that their cable bill isn't. And our funding is tied to cable revenue. So hope you can get, put together a package to operationalize these funding. These findings of the PEG funding study. Uh, thank you. And uh, any thoughts? Just want to trigger for it. Great. Uh, thank you. Um, we'll we'll take it under advisement and uh, we'll consider it for the final plan. Um, if we could move to uh, Tammy Riley. Tammy, you're on mute. Should be at the top left hand corner. Next to the leave button. Unmute. How are we doing? There you go. There we yeah. go. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, thank you again for all the work on this um, plan. Um, it's impressive. Um, and thank you for taking the time to take my comments. I'm Tammy Riley. I'm the executive director for Greater Northshire Access Television, also known as GNAT TV. And we operate three PEG channels on the Comcast system in the Manchester region. And we serve a regional community of 11 towns in that area. Um, as you know, we provide essential media services for individuals, towns and schools and community organizations. Um, and I want to talk a little bit about, in addition to traditional PEG services, we also meet the cable needs of our communities by providing local news and information programming. And the news programming is really essential in this day and age. It exposes the local stories and provides local information that's not otherwise being covered through traditional commercial media outlets, especially in our region, we're sort of sandwiched in between Burlington and Albany. So there's really no television coverage. Um, so we have a real opportunity uh, to serve our community in that way with those information services. 
as we're looking to the future, as we've all discussed, um, it's apparent that our traditional cable subscriber funding is declining. One of the biggest challenges um, is to find the solutions to continue serving the communities and to meet their expectations um, as the landscape changes so fast. Um, and more and more people are consuming this local, this essential local information that you can't find anywhere else through our system. Uh, but their expectations are that it be available everywhere, online, on cable, digitally, and that the technical standards um, match the commercial entities. So as, as small um, pick centers, we struggle to keep up with um, these demands as our funding uh, declines. So I wanted to talk a little bit about that and then just state that we were disappointed that the telecom plant didn't take a deeper dive into the PEG study recommendations because um, it did provide some creative solutions um, and describe the authority of the state and provided solutions for funding for the public benefit sector in terms of PEG, E911 and universal service. Um, so we're disappointed in that, so I want to state that. And finally, um, to echo what Rob was saying, I feel strongly that we can really be a partner in finding solutions and that funding solutions for PEG don't have to be in conflict with um, rate payers and CUDs and that we really need to think hard about how we can work better together and that we're really vital in this. Access stations reflect the needs of the community, the pulse of com the community. We're embedded in the fabric of our schools and our towns and the people individuals and organizations from all all walks of life all population sectors engage with us on a daily basis so we're really embedded and i think we really need to be a part of the solution and be part of the process um, uh, to coming up with solutions for the future and that's really my final thought um, thank you again for all the work and um, for uh, allowing me to speak today thank you <coughs> Thank you, Tammy. I appreciate it. Um, we'll go next to CJ. Hi, CJ. Hey, good afternoon, Chloe. It's nice to see you again. You too. Why don't you take um, it away? All right. So I actually am going to be directing my comments uh, to two areas. Um, so first of all, thank you all for the excellent work on a really large and comprehensive plan. I have some idea of the amount of effort that's gone into it. And uh, so thank you, Matt. Thank you, Clay, for a great prezo. Um, I am here, uh, particularly as I'm on the board of directors of Orca Media. I'm also on the governing board for EC Fiber, which was the first, uh, what was the TUD, because it was under some different legislation than the CUDs, but it's the CUD. Uh, and I was three years on its executive committee, and I think I met you and uh, Matt Dunn working on some of the enabling legislation for rural broadband with uh, EC Fiber's vice chair at the time, Paul Haskell. My background is technology and broadband. Um, I'm the former CIO for a series of telecoms via mergers culminating in Verizon's global fiber optic network and the former CTO for cable and wireless, which is now level three, one of the big providers of fiber optic services worldwide, uh, VP of business operations for a startup called On Fiber, which did uh, mid-sized metropolitan fiber networks and the director of business development for GTE, the alternative to AT&T way back when, where I led the launch of Enterprise Solutions. So I did a lot of um, uh, technology, fiber, and figuring out how money needed to work. The, um, the, main things that I wanted to address have to do a little bit with, um, as you all know, Orca Media is the access center for the Montpelier, Vermont area. It serves central Vermont. Uh, community media is widely recognized as, uh, by the legislature as an important aspect of information and telecom services. And I feel like uh, Rob Perry and Tammy and others have really done a great job of addressing that. Um, just want to call attention to the fact that our coverage of meetings held under open meeting law from select board meetings and town meetings and school board meetings and graduations and of course, you know, state house content and legislative committees uh, came out to be recognized as increasingly important during the pandemic and uh, will likely continue to do so as technology more and more and remote communications run our, our culture. 
Um, so these give Vermont the opportunity to have unsurpassed community engagement and transparency because we uniquely have town meetings and an open legislature. Um, in fact, these hearings themselves are being streamed by ORCA via the statewide TV channel, uh, Vermont Community TV, and the statewide access channel is now HD, which I think is the only access channel in the state so far. So Matt recognized in his excellent presentation the situation with declining revenues from cable television channel subscriptions and their impact on the PEG channels. Um, community broadband access is funded by cable entertainment revenues, and as its importance and community value is growing, uh, uh, seen during the pandemic, the funding is going to be decreasing with the projections of decreasing uh, cable revenues. So in short, uh, my key point here is that it's going to be, I think, important to look at shifting the financing from cable entertainment revenues to uh, financing from streaming revenues. We now have uh, Amazon Prime, Hulu, Netflix, AT&T, as well as a host of other uh, streaming avenues. And so we don't actually need to impact the CUDs. We should probably just be looking to the other uh, uh, monetization channel for uh, entertainment revenues, which is streaming. And the advantage of that is rather than creating a whole new uh, model, you're simply going to the same source and saying, as your uh, revenue shift from cable connections and coax to streaming monetization, we would like to continue to support the community access, which more and more will be using the same media via the same avenue. So you're just switching from the coax and cable subscriptions to the streaming. Um, the metering will need to be a little bit different, but the helpful thing is that the uh, justification and rationalization is the same. Does that make sense? Um, the, the, uh, are there any questions or, or thoughts uh, just on, on how that could be done? Or if, so if there's some technology behind it, but it's eminently doable. My second comment then um, would simply be uh, to look at um, uh, the fiber networks. Um, fiber optic networks support the economy in two significant ways, and there's the obvious one that we've all been, you know, pounding the table for, which is education, business development, uh, jobs, telehealth, uh, agriculture more and more requires it, oddly enough, social engagement and the Internet of Things from, uh, you know, remote driving to talking toasters. Um, you also don't have cell services without backhaul, which means you have to have broadband. Uh, so, you know, good cell services, healthy businesses, healthy students, healthy people with telehealth. There's another uh, huge economic impact that I don't see discussed too often that I wanted to bring up, and that is interest payments. Uh, what do interest payments have to do with fiber optic services in the economy? And the, the, the interest payments have to do with the rule of seven which is often um, cited when people are being taught about investing. And the rule of seven is that if you invest $7 for seven years uh, at 7%, your money will double. But this also applies to borrowing money. And one of the things that happens when you're building fiber optic networks anywhere is that you have to borrow a lot of money because they're expensive. And so if you borrow, uh, say, $50 million at 7% for 14 years, uh, you're going to pay back not just $50 million, you're going to pay back $100 million in interest plus your original $50 million in principal. And the reason I bring this up is that um, if your source of money is an out-of-state lender, then all of that interest money goes out-of-state. But if you want to support your local community, uh, it helps a great deal if your lending source can be an in-state lender because then all that interest money goes back in-state. And uh, for some reason, I seldom see this addressed. It's uh, very well established in the big telecoms um, that uh, that the interest, the, the, the source of money and the interest payments are a critical part of the economic um, equation of uh, of these fiber networks. And in addition, um, the people that control your debt tend to control a little bit your, your, uh, your resource. So there's a huge opportunity here. 
and I'd love to see a little bit more of that opportunity being addressed in the telecom plan because it, it's potentially hundreds of millions of dollars. And for Vermont, that's a lot of money. Uh, that really uh, concludes my commentary. I just want to thank you again for giving me the opportunity and for doing such fine work. Um, please support the PEG channels. They're a great resource for all of us and they make Vermont a special place. And consider uh, looking at the financing model. Thank you. Great. Thank you, CJ. All right. Uh, do we have anyone else online? Otherwise, we'll move to um, We'll move to the phone. If you just want to speak up, uh, let us know you want to talk. All right. Um, let's go to the phone. We have uh, one person on the phone. Uh, I guess hit star six and um, uh, state your name. This is Steve Whitaker from Montpelier. Thank you, Steve. Go ahead. Uh, I, I want to raise a number of things. Some of them you may have heard some before. Um, the this this is not a plan that that meets its statutory requirements by any stretch. Uh, the statutory requirements require addressing each of the goals of 202C with strategic uh, objectives and measurable progress and funding sources needed for each of those goals. Those goals include mobile wireless, competitive choice, open access, et cetera. In many ways, this proposal or this report that the contractor has put together uh, attempts to end around those statutory goals by suggesting that the CUD should be empowered to negotiate those away with private corporations. That is a patently absurd notion, and it, it you know eviscerates the legitimacy of this as, as a planning document. So I think it would be wise for, very wise for the uh, department to admit the failures of the public participation process, admit the failures of the uh, AMO financial analysis element, which you've heard a lot about, admit the failures of not addressing the goals in accordance with statute and not adopt this plan. Uh, start this process anew with uh, possible legislative changes next January uh, to have this built, a uh, telecom plan built on top of the statewide fiber design that's authorized and funded through the uh, community Broadband Board. Um, the recommendations that we, you know, set up the CUDs to take care of tech support uh, and assume responsibility for the high cost areas where Consolidated doesn't want to, to build themselves and even suggest that these CUDs might end up being the carrier of last resort basically looks suspiciously like a private equity scheme where you privatize the profits and you socialize the costs. And this is not, that's a, that's a political agenda being inserted into our telecommunications planning process. It has no business here. This is supposed to be a 10 year telecommunications plan that can be, you know, fine tuned between administrations, but not whiplash between administrations. So, this has been, uh, also I read the contract with CTC. For some reason, somebody intentionally uh, shouldered the department with the assembly of the final draft and not the contractor. The point of inserting language allowing for a private engineering firm to do the plan was to get, un to get reputationally backstopped credibility and uh, objectivity from an engineering point of view, and to have the department, you know, brush off and trivialize most of the public com comment that was inserted into Appendix G is, it's not only an insult to the folks that went through a lot of work to put that public comment into the record, but it basically undermines the entire credibility of the process. The public participation process 
was supposed to be coordinated with AMOs, necessitated, you know, orientation workshops because the plan has been failed. The department has failed to do a plan for 14 years now, or 16. And so the capacity of the public to engage and discuss with confidence the issues. This is not just an Internet plan either, as much as uh, some would like to hope. This is a telecommunications plan, which will rely on cell service and, and public safety, uh, high capacity, you know, bulletproof circuits, public safety grade circuits that are going to make sure a dispatch gets to a radio tower to get to the portable radio in the ambulance. And this that reliability is not in, in this plan anywhere. Uh, that interface, that interoperability with state systems is not in this document at all. So I'm just raising a, a huge red flag that this really thing, this is a hollow with flagrant disregard uh, of the statutory requirements. Uh, in the discussions I've heard these last two days about voice over IP, it's, it's a fallacy to suggest that, you know, consumer education in better batteries or bigger batteries in the homes are the solution when you know darn well, I'll say damn well, that the, all the cable amplifiers, when they lose power, no one's getting a 911 call or a voice call out, no matter how big your batteries are at home. So the, uh, the existence of the consolidated remote terminals, those have about eight hours of runtime, and the, the green version of the cable amplifier, pole-mounted cable amplifiers, have about four hours of runtime. So the newer, grayer ones might have eight hours of runtime. Uh, but we're, you're, you're leaving people at higher risk than ever before by this uh, disregarding these vulnerabilities in the network and not fully digging into those from an engineering point of view. I feel like, you know, Reese used CTC to win the contract and then dumb the plan down to Reese's capabilities instead of utilizing our CTC's engineering expertise. Uh, and I look forward to seeing where all the money went. For this to document, which is not a plan, but the two documents together to have cost nearly three quarters of a million dollars is, is, uh, is grounds for the auditor and the attorney general to take over. Uh, small cells. We recently modified the whole attachment rules, and it was too late by the time people realized what was in there, but the pole attachment rules now consider small cells nothing but a pole attachment, whereas I find a new Verizon small cell on the Village Green, you know, less than 100 feet from where, you know, friends and kids, you know, have their picnics. And, yes, we are preempted on safety issues, but it's sure – we sure do have sighting uh, criteria and opportunity. So I have to respectfully disagree with Will Dodge that 248A is working for everybody. It's working for those who have, you know, $400 an hour, you know, corporate legal budgets to gain the system. Uh, the EPUC system is a, is a tragic farce of public participation, and the costs for Menden and Thetford uh, to lit litigate those cases are enormous. So 248A is not the panacea that it, it looks like from somebody who represents, you know, at and um, But the small cell on Ver Vermont College's green is one that uh, should be a prime example in how we need to reconsider how we cite these. I heard bragging about uh, Canaan Highway coverage, uh, cell coverage along that. Is that more than one carrier, or is that one carrier only? We discovered that AT&T, after taking the, you know, $50, 60000000 million in subsidies uh, at the behest of the governor's opt-in decision, uh, promised to have coverage in many areas, said they had coverage in areas, but when we paid a contractor to go out and measure it, there wasn't coverage there, and AT&T as much as told us to go pound sand. So... Any publicly subsidized uh, cell coverage infill of dead zones should definitely be uh, mandatory all-carriers coverage, necessitating a neutral host. 
the neutral host analysis, the open access analysis are miserable failures of uh, intellectual honesty and, and thorough due diligence in this document. So I, I'll, the AMO analysis, funding analysis, should have dug deep into the telephone personal property tax. It suggests that in uh, Appendix G that the right-of-way fee, we're, we don't really understand who's talking about collecting a right-of-way fee. That's patently absurd and, and ill-informed. We currently have a right-of-way fee in statute in 19 BSA 26A, and it's not being enforced. And the department is party to that with VTRANS. So to, for the department's knowledge of that broadband fee statutory mandate, and then to have the, whoever's responding to the public comments in Appendix G say that we don't know, understand what any of this means, it's just, it's, it's just absurd. It's a fallacy. Uh, there was one of the key public comments filed through the Survey Monkey was about a fundamental and prerequisite uh, network architecture decision of active fiber versus passive fiber. We have one, we have multiple examples of passive fiber in Vermont. We have one example of active fiber, but the ability to upgrade, one of the statutory goals is to make sure that all of our investments are upgradable to future technology and don't foreclose options and opportunities for future technology upgrades. An active fiber network where a, a dedicated glass strand is delivered to each served location rather than through 32, 32 times splitters uh, allows for that upgrade path, whereas the splitters preclude that upgrade path. If somebody needs a higher speed or a you know 100 gigabit or an 800 gigabit service, you have to go build a new fiber cable to that end. You can't do that through passive splitters. So that comment was not responded to in Appendix G, seems to be missing. It was not included in, in Appendix, uh, yeah, the first part of collected public comments. And then it was, you know, trivially said, oh, well, we incorporated it into the plan. Everywhere else the public comments were incorporated into the plan, they were included in the appendix with a note saying we incorporated this on these pages. That was not done. So uh, with the issue of the funding, uh, the attachment fee, the streaming tax, the right-of-way fee, the telephone personal property tax, to hear a contractor say that is not entirely in scope is really, it, it is in the statute and it's in the contract. So to, you know, try to dodge that at this point uh, is a further cause to not adopt this plan and admit you have failed and uh, address uh, response to comments. Public uh, transparency. Steve, Steve, there was no just, just a point of clarification. Uh, Act 154 from last year uh, did it, did it modify the um, the aspect of the the telecom plan on on PEG? based on the fact that the, the Berkshire report was coming out? It, the AMO funding analysis is still in the statute and uh, it's in the, con in the CTC contract. So I don't, I don't, I'm not familiar with the. Uh, okay, the, that's all right. I just wanted to. Uh, you you may be correct, that. but it's still, it's still in the set. It's still in the uh, statutory uh, it's in the CTC contract as one of the uh, deliverables. The propagation analysis uh, seems to be, from, from my reading of the description of how that was gone about, it didn't factor in uh, segment, segmented antennas. It, it appears to have been done on an omnidirectional antenna basis, disregarding uh, tilt and uh, azimuth of segmented antennas, uh, but it's it's grossly different than the maps that AT and T promised to have by now, uh, just on one carrier. I, as you may know, I'm not a 
supporter. We do not want to become known as a state you want to visit only if you're an AT&T customer or only if you're a Verizon customer. The In rural areas where it's not cost-effective for these carriers to build everywhere, the neutral host model where one set of infrastructure is managed by a neutral host operator and through roaming agreements, all carriers are uh, able to deliver and receive calls and broadband services over that infrastructure is the model we should be pursuing for all of the dead zones that we currently have. And engaging the CUDs in owning those small cells and deploying them as a priority uh, is is important. Um, the public participation, to not have published paper plans, to not have, uh, I mean, I eventually got a paper plan, but it was almost like a, a punishment joke, a single-sided black and white, so none of the graphs mean anything in the appendix in, in black and white, and, a, you know, a three-inch stack of paper, uh, loose bounds, no three-hole punch, n nothing. It's, it was just, uh, if, if you're going to do effective public participation, which is the phrase in the statute, uh, the workshops, there's a proposal that was sent to Chris Reckia back by Charlie Larkin and I several years ago in the around the 2014 or 17 time frame. Uh, the AMOs were to be engaged in bringing people up to speed on the dimensions and the capabilities and the, the uh, served and unserved areas ahead of time so people could engage in a meaningful discussion. That is... That was all skipped here, uh, and the AMOs were not engaged. The there was some trivial email back and forth between whether uh, you know a RISI employee was going to do it, and it basically fell off the table. And that, to me, that is a fundamental piece of a public participation process in this plan. Is the undergirding of what this plan is supposed to be about. So that failure alone should disqualify this plan from being adopted. So I'm basically asking to you appeal to y'all's integrity uh, as a department, if if there's any left in the upper echelons there, uh, to not adopt this plan and force this into a, a, a new strategy to get it done. It's not okay to have the group responsible for developing the plan also adopting the plan with not so much as an approval by any uh, body, oversight body. So I'm recommending that if, if the department is to continue to develop the plan uh, or it continue to be done by contract, that the Community Broadband Board have final adoption authority, but only after making an affirmative finding that it hits every one of the statutory requirements and it is complete and thorough according to statute. And otherwise, it's not adopted and it's set back for further view. But this idea, we have a very rapidly closing one-year window before we uh, have to measure this tel this uh, telecom plan against the incentive reg plan for consolidated. Uh, that reminds me that the incentive reg, the treatment of the incentive reg plan in the draft, the final draft, by the con consultant contractor is a fallacy. It is absolutely inaccurate. It says that it's only about basic rate telephone service. But when you go and read the incentive reg statute, 30 VSA 226B, it shall be approved only if it is consistent with all the goals of 202C and promotes competition. So those things alone in 226B would argue for us uh, insisting on access to consolidated fiber, uh, inner office fiber, maybe, maybe, maybe not the local loop. Uh, it's a passive architecture anyway, so it may not be as useful and more it may be impossible to share other than on a wholesale uh, basis. Um, I'm trying not to get too in the weeds for some of the other folks listening. Um, well, Stephen, we do have uh, two more meetings if you want to break it up. Into, okay, that, uh, yeah, that's, that's, well, we're over time already, so I'll stop there. Yep. All right, thank you, Thanks. Stephen. Uh, do we have anyone else who'd like to give a quick comment uh, before we uh, bring this hearing to a close? Clay, can I respond to a couple points real quick? 
Sure, keep it to two minutes though. So with respect to Route 114 in the Northeast Kingdom, that there are multiple carriers there, and I can attest as a user that uh, those sites are online and working. It's not simply a predictive map, but those are sites that work. And if if Mr. Whitaker would like to go to those and test them himself, he really should. With respect to 248A and small cells, I can tell you with a certainty that without 248A, there is a complete hodgepodge of regulation all through the state about whether you would ever even need a permit to put up a small cell anyway. So if anything, strengthening 248A would create more notice for those types of projects, not less. We recently did a project involving nine small cells uh, going up Route 108 in Stowe, and all the joiners in the area all got notified, as did the town. We had plenty of back and forth. Everyone was comfortable with it. And we ultimately um, we ultimately uh, address some concerns and are going to have much better coverage in Stowe. With respect to litigation risk, what I would uh, tell the DPS is that however much litigation, uh, if you want to call it that, that we had for um, contentious sites under 248A, that is nothing compared to the process that you would see if in every single case, you would end up with a suit in federal district court. And if you want to check that, just to start asking your counterparts over in Maine, Massachusetts, and New Hampshire, where that's how things are run. Doesn't make a, a, a difference uh, if you ultimately um, don't care about costs, but the way that 248A issues are resolved end up being much more collaborative. And finally, what I would say, uh, with respect to the neutral host idea, part of the reason that 248A is successful is because tower infrastructure developers, the ones who are entrepreneurial, can find those spaces, lease up, lease up land, and try to be ultimately marketing um, space to multiple carriers, which is how they benefit, and we would benefit as having competition on you know those uncovered spaces so we're not as mr whitaker said just a verizon state or an at&t state um, it is one of those things that 248a handles better than is true with act 250. so that's all simply in defense of saying that 248a really does work well and we hope that the uh the agency or the department will consider advocating for it uh in the final version of the plan thanks great thank you all right, well, we'll bring this hearing to a close. Thank you all for your comments, and uh, I really appreciate it. Um, we'll have another hearing tomorrow uh, at uh, 6 p.m. in Craftsbury. Uh, that will be online as well. And then, like I said, next Monday, the 28th, we'll have a hearing in uh, Dorset at the town clerk's office um, in town, and that information is on our website. So thank you again. I appreciate your um, participation and uh, coming out uh, and um, sitting in a hearing on uh, on a beautiful day. So all right, have a good evening and we'll see you tomorrow. Clay, before you shut down the meeting completely, um, may I put in just a very brief comment? This One is minute. CJ Stumpf again. Yeah, um, so we'll mentioned the wireless coverage map and was it your effort that of driving around and around the development i was in the partly informed by that we'd certainly like to do it again um we have the resources to do it that is my recommendation uh, is to establish a rolling fund to keep that and a, and a and a job to keep that constantly updated my only other 30 second comment is to consider that um when we have limited fiber, which we will always have in low density states, we're essentially creating microscopic semi monopolies, just as we did with AT&T and GTE. And uh, you can recognize those by looking at the churn rates. So they're easy to determine. Um, when in working as an executive in an industry where five nines reliability was a requirement for um, reliability of, of coverage and where there were big teeth if we failed to achieve those, the state might want to consider using that 
uh, uh, that tool, it's proven, it works, it uh, fosters good quality of service and good behavior, and you can use the finds to support things. <laughs> this is not a popular position, but since I'm not having to uh, report to any board, you can use those finds to finance things. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. All right, everyone, have a good night. Thank you.